Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Leo Pengelinen. I'm the Executive Director for the Northern Moranis Humanities Council. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending uh, our Council's first Humanities Fridays event scheduled for the month of October. As you're probably aware, October is Humanities Month here in the CNMI, and we at the Humanities Council are celebrating by holding two Zoom webinars every Friday this month at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., each featuring a different humanities topic. Um, but today, and, and at this time, we'll be listening to a presentation by Sophia Perez, who has spent the last year working on a podcast called Tip of the Spear, which examines the relationship between the US military and the people of the Mariana Islands. She has compiled 15 interviews and will be She'll be offering us an overview of those conversations as well as some conclusions she has been able to draw after speaking with members from across the archipelago and the Pacific. Um, just note that as an attendee, uh, you'll be muted for the duration of the presentation and we'll be asked to use the chat feature to comment or to ask a question. Uh, we'll have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Um, we'll try to stop the presentation 15 minutes to the end of the hour for that. Um, depending on the number of questions, we may unmute attendees um, at the question and answer segment. Um, and we'll ask um, as myself as moderator, I'll try to um, uh, look at, um, you know, who has asked questions first or raise, raises their hands first to try to get you uh, online to ask your, your question personally if you choose to do so. Uh, for those of you tuning in on Facebook Live, you can send your questions by messaging the Northern Marianas College Facebook page. And with that, um, and it being 10.02 right now, Sophia, thank you for being here and feel free to begin your presentation. Thanks, Leo. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen and sound and get this presentation started. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Sophia Perez, and I'm honored to have the privilege to present to all of you today. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take this time to sincerely thank the Northern Marianas Humanities Council for supporting this project and for organizing this webinar. And to everyone listening here and on Facebook Live, thank you and happy Humanities Month. Um, Okay, so I'm going to be talking about this nickname, Tip of the Spear. And um, it's a way that the U.S. military has been conceptualizing the Marianas. Um, certain scholars say different dates for when this date showed up, or this name showed up, but it's usually like early 2000s. And the premise is this. Um, the Marianas Archipelago is the westernmost U.S. territorial possession. So the islands are basically the first line of defense or the closest place to launch an offensive maneuver for the US military in the event of some kind of violent international conflict with an Asian country. Um, and being conceptualized that way has a tangible and multifaceted impact on the Marianas. Um, and so as like tensions rise between the US and China and all that, I just thought this is like a good time to do this project um, you know, I'm a Saipan resident, I am of Chamorro descent, and I was just curious, how do Mariana Islanders feel about this increase in military presence and in being seen as the tip of the spear? So what I did is I interviewed 15 people, um, and they live either on Guam, Saipan, Tinian, um, the big island of Hawaii, Oahu, and then New Zealand. And also one of the interviewees in on the big island is also of Okinawan descent and he lives there as well. And, um, and he's sort of a, an expert on that area. So um, as a whole, these interviewees are composed of past and present politicians, lawyers, activists, academics, cultural practitioners, and veterans. And I interviewed all of them with a few questions in mind. One, how do the interviewees who live in the Marianas feel about being seen as the tip of the spear and why? Um, 
how do they feel about the relationship with the US military in general? And is there anything the interviewees who live in the Marianas would like to see change about their relationship with the US military or the US government in general? And if so, how would that change occur? Um, and these questions are important, I think, because there are recent plans that the military has released for Guam and the Northern Marianas that by the military's own reports are gonna have a huge effect on the environment and economy of this archipelago. And that in turn is gonna have issues, or not issues, but at least an effect on the culture and the identity of the islands. And there's gonna be a lot of turbulence and change and difficult decisions. So these are the times, you know, before things get too crazy that you sort of look back and you figure out what are my values? What's important to this community as a whole and how can that inform decision-making moving forward? Um, so, like I said, it's 15 conversations. I'm just going to summarize. This is going to be basically a compilation. Um, but if you'd like to hear everything, you can tune into the Tip of the Spear podcast, which I'll be releasing in mid-October. Um, and if you want to be notified when the podcast launches, just add your email to this chat. And um, when we alert everyone that's published, you will be on the list. Um, so let me get into the interviewees a little bit. On Guam, we have Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero. She's the managing editor of the University of Guam Press. She's an activist as well. Dr. M Miguel Bavacqua is the co-chair of Independent Guahan and the communications director for the office of Senator Kelly Marsh Titano on Guam. And Julian Agan is the founder and principal attorney of Blue Ocean Law. Um, on Saipan, we have Issa Ariola, the chair of our Commonwealth, a local organization devoted to um, educating the local people about military plans for the CNMI. Uh, senator Sixtu uh, is a current, currently the Saipan Senator. Kimberlyn King Hines, the legal counsel for the Tinian Mayor's Office, the chair of the Commonwealth Ports Authority and legal counsel in Tinian Women Association at all versus Department of Navy at all. We'll get into that later. Um, and then there's also uh, former Senator Pete Rages who is the chair of the second political status commissioning uh, commission. On Oahu, we have David Henkin. He is an earth justice attorney. He recently won a case at the Supreme Court about uh, clean water rights in Hawaii. And he's another legal counsel for the Tinian Women Association in the lawsuit against the Department of the Navy over the training range plan for the CNMI. Um, Tinian is where we have most of our interviewees. I've got Tinian Mayor Edwin Aldon, Don Farrell, famous author and historian. He most recently wrote Tinian and the Bomb. James Mendiola is a former Tinian mayor and a lifetime politician. And Deborah Fleming and Juanita Mendiola are the founder and president, respectively, of the Tinian Women Association. Um, on the Big Island, I mentioned Robert Kajiwara. He's the founder of the Peace for Okinawa Coalition. He is of Okinawan and Hawaiian descent. Um, he's at the UN today, I think. And then New Zealand. I have Dr. Sylvia Frain, who is a peace and conflicts expert. She got her PhD in the subject in New Zealand, and she's currently a research affiliate for the National Center for Peace and Studies, or Peace and Conflict Studies. Okay, so before we really get into it, we kind of need to go over a brief history of like the Marianas and kind of the Pacific. Um, and so when we talk about why, uh, the Marianas are seen as the tip of the spear. It has a lot to do with location. And so um, author and historian Don Farrell kind of helped set the tone for that. Not until World War II did America really realize how important was the strategic geographical location of the Mariana Islands. At the 145th longitude, they form essentially a barrier between the Pacific Ocean and the Philippine Sea. On the Philippine Sea side is Asia. On the Pacific Ocean side is America. And America never really appreciated that, although they had the island of Guam, they did not take all the rest of the Marianas. And when World War II came along and Japan held all the islands north of Guam, cutting off our communications to the to the U.S. Philippine territory, they all of a sudden realized what a mistake they had made. 
that this was where America had to be, because if America wasn't here, somebody else would be. And so at that point, during World War II, Guam became the tip of the spear, even though that term had never been used before. Okay, just something to note with these excerpts. Um, this is a project about perspective. So some of these, you know, these are all people's opinions. These are ways that people tell the story. And that's what my interest was. So I don't, I hope as audience members, you can take what everyone says as a grain, of, like with a grain of salt, you know, and you're going to see there's a vast um, range of opinions. You know, Don Farrell is willing to work with the tip of the spear um, terminology and he, he sees a lot of meaning in it because of the location and the way that that's naturally going to be um, sort of like a militarized zone in his opinion. And then we can also look at the way Dr. Bavakwa of Guam sees it. Um, he sort of keeps track of a lot of Guam's nicknames and, and takes issue with plenty of them. So this is going to be the longest excerpt um, of the presentation. Just bear with me. He has, he gives a lot of information. I just think it's super helpful. After World War II, Guam was called the supermarket of the Pacific. And it gets that name because of how Guam, looking at all the places the U.S. had taken in Asia and the Pacific, Guam was the hub for distribution. So okay. if you, wherever your food came from, if you, were, if you were eating as part of the U.S. military, it came from Guam. In the Vietnam War, it's known as the world's largest gas station. Okay. Because of uh, the largest sort of underground gas sort of storage units mm -hmm. are built on Guam at that time. It also gets names like unsinkable aircraft carrier, which is actually a term that a lot that different places have an unsinkable aircraft carrier. But then what happens is after Vietnam, Guam gets some names, which are all about how U.S. forces are declining. U.S. The U.S. lost the Vietnam War. The Cold War sort of uh, is coming to an end. And so, and so then Guam gets names like um, the Sleepy Hollow of the Pacific. And then mm. Guam also gets, as one commander referred to it, the Trailer Park of the Pacific. Because it wasn't like a big base. It wasn't a super important base. The military didn't really care about it. But you also didn't get the joy of being in a foreign country, at least. You were like in America, except it's brown. Right, and so the sense. idea of Guam as a trailer park really comes from the military thinking that Guam is, is a crappy place mm -hmm. and then developing this. And so there was a, there was a commander who got in some trouble because he, he said, well, Guam is no longer the trailer park of the Pacific. He said it in a media interview. Um, wow. and he was trying to argue that this is because people are paying more attention to Guam. But he ended up revealing that this is actually what people in the military were saying about Guam, that it was a trashy place. Then what happens is that Guam starts to matter again to the U.S. So it doesn't really happen in the 90s so much, but in the early 2000s, especially after the Bush administration comes in, that's when you start to see Guam matter again within the military's mindset. And part of it is because of how... Um, the September 11th attacks in the United States changed the U.S. global view. The U.S. vision of the world starts to shift towards the Pacific and to Asia, right? That traditionally U.S. military and strategic planning is, is Atlantic-based. It's focused on Europe, Russia, but then now China, North Korea, and then the Middle East and sort of hot spots in the Middle East sort of force this movement of perspective and so we can actually think in some ways, although Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, one of the Secretary of Defenses under Bush, he doesn't necessarily coin the term, but he creates the sort of the landscape for, for Guam to, be, to have this new value. Because Rum, one of the things that Rumsfeld said is that if Guam didn't exist, then we would have to create it. Because mm -hmm. in the mind of the Bush administration, Guam satisfied so many of the things that they wanted. That's when you start to hear people speak about Guam in a new, in a new way. So one of, the, one of the first articles that happens around this is in 2002 in the LA Times. And it's a, it, it has one of the craziest uh, titles for an article ever. It, it, the title is something like, Dot on Map 
regains strategic posture. Mm -hmm. And around that time, there's another, there's another article which says, U.S. looking for base overseas remembers that it already has one, referring to Guam. Wow. And so, so you see in this moment where US, the U.S. sort of military worldview is changing, and then it's, there's this reminder that Guam is there, and Guam is actually what you're looking for. Because you can have a base where there's no treaties to deal with. You can have a base which is close, right on the edge of Asia, but not too close. And at that time, China couldn't uh, reliably hit Guam with anything, which meant that it was, it was beyond perfect in that sense. That's where you see for the first time people saying that Guam is the tip of America's spear, that we are the tip of the spear. And I can't remember exactly the first commander to, to use it, but it is in the early 2000s where they're talking about how they're right on the edge of Asia. Right. Okay. So lots of good information there. But I mean, the main takeaway is basically that sorry, because of the strategic location of the Marianas, the U.S. valued having a military presence on the archipelago. And part of valuing that meant integrating the people of the Marianas into the American family. And so the next thing I want to talk about is Tinian and some of the, the discussions and negotiations that happened on the island surrounding like the covenant and creating the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, it required leasing the northern two thirds of Tinian. It's probably worth noting that on this land is the airstrip that the Enola Gay took off to drop the atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima during World War II. Um, so during these negotiations about this proportionally massive uh, piece of land, the US military offered to build on the leased land a military base that would house military personnel and their families and come equipped with schools, hospitals, other amenities and job opportunities that would otherwise never be available to the people of Tinian. So here's more about it from Deborah Fleming and Juanita Mendiola of the Tinian Women Association. They wanted to make it quick and fast. So they came and they offered the people of Tinian all kinds of goodies like they took videos and photos of Schofield Base on Hawaii and showed all those houses and mm. how beautiful the landscapes are. Uh, and it wasn't only uh, Schofield, there was, uh, I think there's another Air Force Base that they took a picture of. And so they presented that and then oh, the they Anderson said, and Naval yeah, Naval and so they, and they told the people that all the facilities the hospitals, the schools, the commissary, the theaters the, will be shared with the community. They've never done that before, but because given the the need, their immediate need, mm -hmm. they wanted to overcome a lot of the hurdles that they would have faced had they just came in and said they wanted to lease the property for their base. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to add that little carrot right. and apples in front so that yeah. they will bite. Right, and worth noting that that base has yet to be made or to be built. Um, so now that we have the historical background, let's talk about what it means to be part of the tip of the spear today. So um, the Commonwealth Ports Authority Chair, Kimberlyn King Hines, talks about the cultural clash that comes from the indigenous people of the Marianas being integrated into the U.S. in this way. It's just, it's one of the many challenges. We struggle today with assimilation that's been kind of the way of basically wiping out the Chamorro culture, right? The Americanization, the Westernization, the, the taking away of just these practices and reliance on the Western way of life. So, um, you know, it's a struggle because we are Americans, but we're Chamorros. And obviously, you know what I mean? At certain times, there's going to be a conflict in terms of, of what that looks like. Um, another aspect of it is that the military offers opportunities that otherwise wouldn't exist for um, the people of the Marianas to get college educations, to get jobs off island, um, and former Kenyan Mayor James Mendiola kind of points that out. Most of the high school graduates are taking advantage of it because that's the only way to expose themselves going to the States because you or explore the world. I, I, I could feel the way they feel. Because right. there's no way to get off the island 
and get educated. So indoctrination, we start taking, telling them that once you go to the military, serve for four years, five years, six years, and then you get the GI Bill. Then you go to school mm -hmm. and come back. Some of them that have done that never come back because the salary of the years very low. So yeah, one of the issues is that there's several different value systems basically playing out, you know, different cultures on the island. And um, one thing that uh, the second political status commission chair, Pete Rages, points out is that when those values um, are at odds with each other, you know, whether that's military needs and the local economic needs or um, the way that people feel it's, that the environment should be treated, there needs to be like a dialogue between these two sides. We have the highest mortality rate per capita in this area, including Guam, in the military. So patriotism is not an issue. Economic survival is an issue. And so we need to be careful how we draw the landscape for our future generation that are coming up. You know, we need to protect them. And if we're not careful on, on what we do, I give a lot of credit to the first political status commission for an excellent document that became a reality for CNMI. Because it's not perfect, but it's close to being perfect. There are issues, like any other uh, agreement. But in our agreement, we have a section that provides that if we uh, wanted to raise an issue and negotiate, we, we have that. And if we are unhappy with what's going on, then we have that vehicle to go to. We just need the U.S. to respond quickly on, on some of the issues we raise. So we'll go deeper into this in a bit, but one of the major issues um, that's getting sort of difficult for people is the training ranges that the military wants to build in the CNMI and, um, and on Guam, and it's sort of all predicated on moving 5,000 Marines from Okinawa to Guam. So for sort of a wider perspective on this specific wide movement of troops, we'll talk to Sylvia Frain in New Zealand, the peace and conflict studies expert. So, so much of what's happening right now, while it might be conceived of, oh, that's happening on Guam, or oh, that's planned for the Northern Marianas, it is all connected. And it's even connected to the entire Pacific region. So really looking back to the U.S. participation in World War II um, really laid the blueprint, if you will, for um, what current U.S. militarization looks like now. So the specific project relating to the Marianas relates back to the militarization impact in Okinawa, Japan, which is very small in terms of land but hosts, I believe, 75% of the U.S. Marine presence for all of Japan, including the mainland islands. So it's a heavily militarized zone. Um, there's long histories of sexual violence, sexual assault to the local community, as well as what we consider the communities along the fence line, so surrounding the military bases. And it's that steadfast resistance by the Okinawans um, that have pressured the U.S. military to reconsider that highly militarized presence. Well, then that translates to relocating 5,000 of those Marines who were currently stationed in Okinawa. And instead of having them located in one area, they're going to be going through rotations. So a few months of training here, a few months of training there. And those sites that are designated now include the Northern Marianas, Guam is where the housing would be, but it also includes Hawaii and Darwin in Australia. It's a long, very layered, complex situation, and there's many moving parts and moving pieces to it. But unfortunately, some of the scholars I've read say for the U.S. military, all roads lead to Guam. Right, so moving 5,000 Marines to, uh, from Okinawa to Guam is going to have major impacts on the Marianas. And last summer, Guam activist Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero shared her perspective on the matter. So at that time, this is like July 2019, the U.S. military had commenced construction of a controversial training range uh, for those additional Marines. And the range is in Latexan, also called Ritidian. 
um, and that's a culturally and environmentally significant area of Guam. So here is. So this most recent resolution was to pause construction on the live fire training range complex mm -hmm. in response to um, several sort of discoveries of artifacts and important cultural sites, sacred sites, while bulldozing the like limestone forest there to build the firing range. They keep finding remains. They keep finding uh, Lusung and Lati and these are you know areas they have to halt construction and send a archaeology team in to take a look at it but you know when they've um, already disturbed the site it also disturbs like the information that we could learn about what it was like in its original state you know and so um 26 groups we wrote a letter to the governor and we asked to meet with her about this and to basically halt um the construction of the range and that same week the guam legislature introduced the resolution and then um we met with the governor and then there was a public hearing for the resolution and that's the public hearing that you're referring to and so i think um, you know, because the resolution is very specific to wanting the ability to say enough is enough, that like we need to be able to stop construction like this. It is destructive to our sacred and historic sites. Um, but the reality was, you know, despite us sort of appealing to our governor, despite her writing a letter to the admiral requesting a halt to the construction despite the legislature's resolution, which actually just passed on Friday. Uh, it went up to session uh, on Friday and it passed with 13 uh, yeses and two noes. So, you know, of course the admiral said, no, construction has to keep going. Right, and, and construction won't just be happening on Guam. Um, as Earth Justice Attorney David Henkin shared with me just a few weeks back, the military's plans for the CNMI also include the building of highly destructive training ranges on Tinian and Pagan. And ironically, those ranges are set to be constructed on the same land where uh, the base with the hospital and schools and movie theater, etc., on Tinian was supposed to be built. We got engaged in the issue, uh, it's now almost uh, five years ago. Uh, so we, we were contacted by uh, folks working in the Northern Marianas who were very concerned about what they were learning about Navy plans uh, for stationing Marines on Guam and what the implications of those plans might be for people in the Northern Marianas. Because uh, when the Navy first started talking about moving thousands of Marines to Guam from Okinawa, what everyone in the Northern Marianas had been told was that it would have very limited effect uh, in the Northern Marianas, that the Marines would primarily train on Guam, that they couldn't do all of their training on Guam, but they do a very small amount of very limited uh, live fire training, really just target practice um, on the island of Tinian. Uh, people in the Northern Marianas were specifically told that every other island uh, would be uh, infeasible for doing any training for the Marines, including specifically the island of Pagan, uh, would not be a reasonable place for those Marines to train. And again, the training on Tinian would be limited to target practice with bullets. Uh, and this was everything that the Navy was telling folks in around 2010 when they gave the green light to moving thousands of Marines to Guam. So it was, um, you know, a matter of great concern for uh, for folks living uh, in the Northern Marianas to learn in around 2015 that in fact the the Navy had quite a bit more in store for the people of the Northern Marianas and that if thousands of Marines were going to be moving to Guam uh, we could expect um, not only training on Tinian but also on Pagan and the nature of the training was radically different uh, from what folks have been told back in 2010. Uh, now, instead of some target practice, limited target practice with bullets on Tinian, um, for, for that island, uh, the residents of that island would be subjected uh, to nearly half of the year, um, highly uh, disruptive and destructive training on the northern two-thirds of the island with artillery and with mortar and uh, amphibious assaults, and people would be cut off from uh, traditional uh, and, and recreational fishing grounds and, and places where people would gather um, uh, traditional plants for subsistence and, and just generally it would be 
highly disruptive to the people of Tinian. Uh, cattle grazing on the military lease area would, of course, be out of the question while live fire training was happening. And the tourism-based economy would be, uh, would be crippled by uh, this type of training because no one wants to have their, you know, vacation getaway be interrupted by exploding mortars and artillery. Uh, this noise and disruption would not only uh, affect life on Tinian, but it would extend across the channel to the southern part of Saipan. And then, of course, it would be highly disruptive to air travel between Tinian and Saipan. So people needing to travel from Tinian to get medical procedure or medical assistance on Saipan would have to route around the life fair training. So extremely disruptive for those folks. And then uh, on the island of Pagan, which again had previously been told uh, that it was going to be not practical uh, for the Marines to do any training there. Uh, Pagan, which uh, if the families that have ancestral ties to it are eager to reclaim and resettle, uh, would become just a, a wasteland of military training with uh, not only artilleries and mortars like on Tinian, uh, but ship to shore shelling and bombs from above and just the entire northern part of the island, including the site of the, the, the village that was uh, affected by the volcanic eruption in the early 80s, just everything would be devastated and um, the island would be entirely uninhabitable. Right, so just to wrap up this topic, uh, I'd like to return to Okinawa because that's kind of what started these more recent build-up uh, projects. So it would seem that because 5,000 Marines are being moved from Okinawa to the Marianas that um, the U.S. forces in Okinawa are in the process of demilitarizing or lightening the burden. Uh, but according to Rob Kajiwara, uh, actually they're creating a new base in a place called Hanoko Bay. So um, the U.S. and Japan are currently building a, another military base on Okinawa Island. It's at a place called Hinoko. Hinoko um, has a coral reef that is said to be the second most biodiverse reef in the world. It contains hundreds of rare and endangered species. Um, it's a precious reef for Okinawans. And what Japan and the US are doing, they're paving over the reef to build this new military base. Um, and Okinawans have long um, resisted this base, peacefully resisted, and <clears throat> both the U.S. and Japan continue to blatantly violate the will of the Okinawan people. Over 70% of the population voted against the base, and with another 9% voting uh, undecided. Got it. So then what happened? Does the referendum keep them from building the base? <laughs> no, no. Uh, <laughs> both the U.S. and Japan have completely ignored the results of the referendum, and they're pushing forward with the construction anyway. Okay, so now that everybody's kind of caught up on some of the, you know, conflicts of today, we can kind of go into how people feel about being the tip of the spear here in the Marianas. So Issa Areola is the chair of our Commonwealth, and um, here's what she has to say about it. My personal kind of relationship to this name comes from a more critical angle where I've heard other kind of activists and scholars really pull it apart, you know, as a kind of really almost kind of disgusting way to frame the islands um, as this kind of perimeter of the United States that's this forward-facing, almost sacrificial lamb um, and this whole military-industrial complex. And then conversely, we have Don Farrell. Now that spear could turn around and point the other way. Mm. Are, we, are we at the tip of our spear or are we at the tip of China's spear? Right. We were at the tip of Japan's spear and they used it. Mm -hmm. So you know, these islands are not gonna sit here without somebody's military control. Right. So I think sometimes the question between some of these um, perceptions of the name is basically how useful is this framing, you know, and, and what does the framing imply? So Senator Sixtu, what he points out is that, well, he's, he's curious what the ramifications of being called the tip of the spear would be just in terms of military strategy. 
Now you've told your enemy, I am the tip of the spear, right? Mm -hmm. You're telling your enemies. I think that's necessarily correct per se. Maybe it's just a move for you, for you to make us believe in this. But at the same time, you've already set up your resources elsewhere to make sure you fake the enemy that we're the tip of the spear. So I don't agree with it. And number two, you can't say that you're going to mobilize all your resources to the tip of the spear. If anything, you should abandon the tip of the spear because everyone knows about it. Here's Dr. Miguel Pavacua's opinion. Oh, oh man, I hate that. In fact, um, a lot of my dissertation was written around hating the nicknames that Guam gets from the military. Mm -hmm. And then the tip of the spear is a big one because we have to be cautious, especially for those of us that live in the Marianas. We have to be very, very cautious because the tip of the spear, we should take it seriously because it reveals for us, to us, our value to the United States. That sort of, that Guam is not, Guam and the Marianas are not part of the United States because they love Kiliguin. <laughs> or because they love Marmars, or because they want to protect the cocoa bird. Guam and the Marianas are attached to the United States for strategic military purposes. And that is the defining, the defining sort of need on their end. And because of that, that being called the tip of the spear isn't something that anyone should feel patriotic about. It isn't something that anybody should feel happy about because it means that we are of value to the United States. It is something which objectifies the, the islands and objectifies the people. And then Julian Agen had sort of a similar opinion. For sure. Um, I absolutely take issue with the characterization because it, it almost presupposes that there are no people who live here. I mean, that's if you follow the language that people in power often invoke or deploy to describe Guam, that's, what, that's one such example, tip of the spear. The other one is this un sinkable aircraft carrier, right? These are these this is really innocuous genocidal language because it has the effect of disappearing an entire people whose homeland this is. And that's exactly why the US military invokes this sort of language because then it's the, the preoccupation is concerned solely and entirely with the US military's needs and not the people who live here. And honestly it's it's exceedingly egregious. Right, so as you can tell a lot of people take issue with being called the tip of the spear. But one of the interesting things that I learned as I was interviewing people, that doesn't translate into being anti-military at all. Like a lot of the people that don't like being called tip of the spear actively want to work with the military and are totally fine with having military presence on their islands. So because we've been talking about the base and about the ranges that would be on Tinian, you know, three miles away from schools and, you know, all of the things that Tinian may have to lose from the wrong type of participation in their eyes from the military and all they may be able to gain from the right type of participation. I just wanted to sort of focus in this presentation on the view from Tinian on the relationship between the military and the Marianas. So we'll start with Mayor Aldon. So you know one, uh, one of our two is sitting down in the beach having a very nice view of the sunset and then you know, grab the margarita, the margarita shaking, <laughs> ask the waiter, what is that? And they say, oh, that's the bombing up. No, what bombing? <laughs> There's no bombing in the brochure. Something like that. That's not what we want. We want, we want to coexist. Coexistence was a common um, theme when asked, you know, what, what is the ideal relationship with the military? So here's former Senator David Singh. I tend to keep my mouth shut because all my kids are in the military plus what they're doing now here is not really bad, they're just staying there. I heard military using live ammo for practicing here. So I was listening and said live ammo, maybe the M16 like that. And that's, that's to me, that's perfectly okay, but not the Big bomb cannot hear. And here's the Tinian Women Association. Their presence are welcome, but not mm -hmm. the destructive type. Right. If they if they build up this island to help economically for them and us, that would be great. Mm -hmm. you know, we can coexist. Yeah, we can with coexist. the original plan mm -hmm. as 
problems, but can we really trust them to really keep their word? They haven't demonstrated anything. So that perspective where the people of Tinian are willing to work with the military, but there's a trust issue that needs to be addressed, that narrative came up again and again in the interviews. Um, and then there were people across the archipelago that said that. People in the Marianas, there are aspects of the buildup that left some people feeling betrayed, but not like they don't want to, you know, work with the military. And, and one of the major examples of that of feeling both ways at once is the divert airfield on Tinian, which would basically offer the US military another place to land its aircraft in the event that Anderson Air Force Base on Guam is compromised. So Kim, the chair of the CPA, was instrumental in negotiating that agreement to create that divert, that divert airfield on Tinian. And at the same time that she was participating in those negotiations, she was also the Tinian Women Association's legal counsel in a lawsuit suing the Navy over the plans for the destructive live fire training ranges on Tinian. So here's your perspective on like supporting one plan and resisting another. It was deliberated for a long time. I mean, the divert to come into fruition to, to get to where we got to this last May, it took years, right? And here we are. And as part of the divert negotiation process, it was that, hey, uh, the relationship is, is very damaged. We don't trust you. And that was set on the table. I know because I said it, you know, I don't trust you. I don't trust that you're looking out for the best interest of the people of, of the Commonwealth. And yeah, I don't trust that you're looking out for the best interest of the people of Tinian. But in good faith, because that's who we are as a people, we will come and sit to the table and have this discussion, right? Which we did. And we agreed to that because I think Tinian has been very clear that we don't object to training. We just object to you destroying our way of life, which is what the CGMT represents to the community of Tinian. And just a little bit more about the divert. Don Farrell does a great job just offering some details. It was mutually beneficial. Hmm. The Department of Defense through the Department of the Air Force paid to the CNMI 21 plus million dollars for the lease on that little piece of property there adjacent to the current airport. Mm -hmm. That money is supposedly, I hope, uh, identified for putting in uh, all of the facilities necessary to turn the Tinian commuter terminal, mm -hmm. the largest commuter terminal in the Western Pacific, right, into a real international airport. It'll pay for the electronics for the instrument landing systems it'll pay for the uh, uh the pipeline from the port uh, it'll pay for the new fuel tanks it'll pay for all the junction boxes it'll pay for everything that we need to make that airport capable of receiving direct flights from japan korea whoever wants to come to the island mm -hmm. now we would be independent from saipan and we could have our own economy mm -hmm. right now we don't have an economy So moving on, um, I tried to ask as many interviewees as possible what they would want. You know, like what relationship with the military, like a better relationship with the military would look like. And so one of the main things that I heard a lot about was um, a reestablished feeling of trust. We need to work on trust. Uh, we want the military to trust us that when we say we're going to support you on this, that we do support them, that we don't back out on our work. But we also expect that when they say they're not going to do this, that they don't do it. And more importantly, when they say they're going to do this, that they do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. There are people on Tinian that are still hoping to see that base from the original covenant agreement. Just go back to the original proposal. The base? Yeah. Build a base and don't bomb it. Yeah. You, you're welcome to come and live here mm -hmm. anytime. You, this, you can build your hospital here, and you can be the major hospital sector for the military in the Pacific Zone. Mm -hmm. uh, Oceanic, Oceana. Yeah, that's a great idea. Do no issue with presence. Build another presence school. is okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. but not that kind, you know. Absolutely. They, have, they really do have to stop that. And keep our historic places open so that our tourism uh, industry can thrive. Thrive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, 
some Mariana Islanders want a focus to be more on the culture rather than the utilitarianism of the place. I may be wrong in my history, but there is Sparta and there is uh, Athens. One is a war machine and one is cultural machine. I want to be the cultural machine. I want us to be of diverse culture, mixed culture. I want us to be civilization rich with humanitarian whatever. Everything is about love and peace and harmony. And then uh, Dr. Bivakwa had an interesting idea of what that piece would look like. As somebody who believes that Guam should be decolonized, leave a territorial status behind, um, ideally gain more autonomy, and that with autonomy should definitely become more connected to the Northern Marianas Islands. I strongly believe that the Marianas, we take up this huge part of the Pacific, right on the edge of Asia, that our role should not be a spear, which is pointed at one side against the other, but we should be the bridge that connects East and West, that that is what our purpose should be. And we would be more prosperous and we would probably, probably be safer if that was our focus. I always think maybe we should, we should try to be Switzerland. <laughs> mm -hmm. Instead of being the tip of the sphere, we should be the Switzerland of the Pacific. And Julian Agin is uh, either at the UN or about to be there, um, hoping that there's gonna be more accountability on the part of the US for some of these military actions. It's about speaking truth to power. And that's what Protehi Latexa, the group I worked with too recently, to file this international filing, you know, a submission to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That's what the filing is about. We're saying, hey, pump the brakes for a second <laughs> and actually consider, you know, the US's international legal obligations. Like if you really pay attention to how the US talks about the military buildup build of Guam, they often cite international law. They cite their own treaty obligations, but only selectively. They choose to cite only the treaties or the agreements that they've signed with Japan, purely bilateral agreements between two countries to transfer troops from Okinawa to Guam. They never talk about the wide range of international treaties, multilateral treaties that the United States signed, you know, and at least in theory agreed to, right? And those treaties, for example, like the ICCPR I mentioned earlier, contain the right of self-determination, the UN Charter, like all of these other things, like they matter, you know? And I think we just have to hold the US military especially to account and remind the United States of these obligations and say, surely these obligations mean something. Law is at least theoretically meant to restrain might. You know, like otherwise the, the world order would be might makes right. So you can probably, you probably noticed that political status, sovereignty, um, uh, self-determination, these are concepts that come up a lot when, when the military and the Marianas are in a negotiation because two equal sides can't, you need two equal sides to negotiate, right? So we're gonna do our final excerpt here with Issa Ariel and she's gonna talk a little bit about how sovereignty plays into this. The covenant negotiations were supposed to have been made between two parties, um, but there's. I think. I, I think we're at a point in our history where, where we seriously need to either rework, renegotiate, unpack what sovereignty means. Because I'm learning more and more that the way that sovereignty was envisioned during the drafting of the covenant was we took citizenship, we gave up sovereignty. You know, and there wasn't really a clear idea of even what sovereignty meant. And so this idea to kind of be able to govern yourself, like I said, autonomously, is something that we, whether that's renegotiating our political status or, you know, it, whether, I don't, you know, I don't think the community is ready for that just yet. But personally, I envision something like that, you know, where, where we really have to kind of go back and redraw what, what we understand as like, what, what are the values that are driving our community? How do we want to govern ourselves? You know, how, how do we want to participate in that governance rather than just being told what to do? All right, so to conclude, I would say I found maybe three major trends, right? So while many Mariana Islanders take issue with their homeland's designation as the tip of the spear, Few are truly pro or anti-military. They have some plans that they support, some plans that they don't. They have ideas of what good presence looks like and what an unjust presence looks like. 
Um, and the relationship between Mariana Islanders and the US military is complex and in constant negotiation. And in many ways, the Mariana Islands are still discovering the extent of their power to determine the parameters of that relationship. Um, and to take it a little further, I think that this process will define and is currently defining the values, culture, and sovereignty of the people of the Marianas. And it constitutes a major or a modern indigenous journey that echoes across the Pacific. And I mean, when I say it echoes, I mean that in two senses. I mean, other people, other indigenous peoples are coming up against similar challenges. And also the way that the Marianas handles this challenge will have ramifications across the Pacific because as several peoples come up against the same thing, they're learning from each other. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening and I'd like to open the floor up for any questions or comments. All right, thank you, Sophia, so much for that presentation. Um, I, ju I do wanna honor uh, a couple of uh, comments slash questions made in our chat while you were speaking. And then we can go to see if uh, any member of the audience would like to um, ask additional questions. So I'm gonna try to summarize this. There seems to be a theme, um, at least coming from a couple of our audience members. Um, feeling and, and mind you, this probably came in midway through your presentation um, feeling that there's an incomplete perspective in your presentation, uh, that there seems to be a focus on negative impacts of U.S. military presence and future build-up plans. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, are we thinking, did you consider going to individuals who um, are thinking about future impacts economically um, in terms of strategic protection um, given the threats, uh, such as, you know, coming from North Korea um, and other types of threats. Um, so how, perhaps, there's not a clear question here, but I guess the, the, the concern is that the presentation or the perspectives you share isn't as balanced. Uh, are you able to address that? Sure. Um, so first of all, and this is something that I think anyone that attempts to cover this conflict is gonna come up against. One of the hardest things about trying to get a balanced perspective is that the military will not talk to you. So I reached out to several people who would be kind of like PR type people for Joint Region Marianas or even like liaison type roles and was basically like denied interviews or left hanging, you know? As for civilians, I did my best to reach out to people who basically I didn't, I picked politicians who know exactly what the balance needs to look like. And I was surprised to say that um, not a lot of people brought up being concerned about China. I mean, we have Don Farrell who said, look, someone's going to occupy, you know, but the people of Tinian, what I got the most from them was that there was a lot to be, uh, to benefit from economically. From having the military there and I'm hoping that um towards the tail end of the conversation or of the presentation you saw that yes like there were a lot of people who came forward and said there's so much potential for positivity here and um and that the military is welcome uh was there anything else Leo? Yeah, just uh, I also um, added to the chat, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. And uh, did we have one here. You can also type that out in the chat. Let's go to... Um, Here we have um, Baron Tyrone. Hey, Baron. Baron Hi, am I back yet? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead with your question. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Hi, Sophia. Um, 
All right, so I typed it out, but I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, the tip of the spear shows an incomplete perspective, in this case, one of offense on the part of the wielder of the spear. However, with foreign military flybys, threats from North Korea, and the aftermath of both world wars, a broader perspective is that we are the defensive front of the shield, placed between attacks and the wielder of the spear. In either case, we are a clear and present target, target, a weapon to be parried or a shield to be destroyed or taken and repurposed. We think we should talk more about and give names to these per other perspectives in the ongoing discussion. You know, that was kind of um, what I was attempting to do here. Like, even if you look at the um, presentation itself and you have like the Chamorro bone spear, you know, my, my hope was basically to incorporate the people within this title, you know, it, and, and I don't mean to say there's no role that the military could have in the islands that would be positive. But when you call a place the tip of the spear, there is an absence there because there's a spear is owned by somebody. There's no stories about a spear tip. You know, there's stories about what's done with a spear tip maybe, but hardly ever would you focus on that. You know, a spear tip is very replaceable. It's like, uh, it's utilitarian. So yeah, I would say I agree that um, there's like a lot of meaningful conversations to be had about shifted perspectives, um, maybe perspectives that are more kind of like what we heard from Tinian, where um, where there's two people, two sides involved, you know, not just one side with the possession. All right, thank you, Farron, for that question, and Sophia for your response. We have um, Lawrence Camacho with the question, so I'm bringing them on. Just take a moment. Yeah, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can mm -hmm. hear you. Go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, I'm going to look for it here real quick. Um, so I, I wrote down that I wonder what the position of our U.S. Congressional Delegates Office is, right? Uh, they should be well informed on where the U.S. strategically is and how it is influenced. Uh, through their representation of us in the islands here as an office that is there at the U.S. Congress to be able to to have this discussion. So if you're saying that the military is is moot or <clears throat> not, you know, putting out a lot of the good information that we need to hear, the education of our people should then translate through the Congressional's office, for they should know. And I know that they're not able to talk about, you know, um, sensitive issues and topics and and information of that sort, but they should be able to to educate our people on perhaps the balancing value of where we could be as we uh, make this a win-win situation and not necessarily a, a compromise for one to come in over the other because we do have a powerful document there in Washington, D.C. called the U.S. Covenant. And if we revert back to that, it's that special relationship that we have between a smaller uh, nation, if you will, like the Commonwealth that we have, our islands, and a larger federal government, right? So a smaller government and a larger government, in that it should be able to be represented. And through that office, I think we should gain a lot from. So, um, you know, again, I say, but the military should talk to our congressmen. Uh, that is what he, they're there for in D.C. Bring the voices of our people to the table and then be able to come back to our people through the voices of the military to allow us to understand what really the problem is and then how we can all work together to achieve that. I worry that um, our islands could very well be unprotected if we continue on in this path and let's say the U.S. just says, okay, well, we're not going to be able to achieve anything there. I, I don't know that's ever going to happen, but I just worry that uh, we are out there, we could be out there on our own little island alone and unafraid. Uh, and lack of protection that we could get, uh, which is what we're, we're benefiting from today. I'm a military person, so I understand at the strategic level after working uh, and serving in the military for more than 20 years, where we could be, um, but I, and I revert back, right? So I'm very patriotic, but at the same time, I was first more before I became, you know, a person that wore the uniform. So I balance that out and I just want to ensure that we're, we're thinking of the future of our islands, not necessarily from just the, the standpoint that we have heard already, but every, uh, what about looking at it from a different angle? Over. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really, really good point. And um, part of what I'm excited about with launching this podcast is that 
I can just keep doing interviews. You know, I would love, I would love to talk to our congressional representatives, you know, in my case, Kalili. Um, and I think that that would be really interesting to see their perspective, you know? Um, and I, I just, yeah, I appreciate what you said about just incorporating as many angles as possible, because I think that's so important. Like, my one criticism for tip of the spear as a name is just that it's only one angle, you know? And so I think it helps everybody. The more information that comes into the conversation, the more people who are sharing, like that can only help us get to a better balance, you know? So I, yeah, I just really agree with what you're saying. All right, great. Thank you, Lawrence and Sophia. Um, we're coming to the end of the hour, so I just wanna give a few remarks to close out the presentation. Um, thank you to the audience for your participation, for joining us. Uh, for those of you who have made comments and uh, asked questions, um, we do wanna alert you to other webinars coming up. So if you haven't, um, if you haven't checked it out already, please visit our website at www.nmh council.org. We have a listing of uh, seven more webinars coming up this month at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, every Friday. Uh, we're reappropriating our Fridays and calling it Humanities Fridays here in the CNMI. Uh, we, join, we invite you to join us celebrate Humanities Month by participating in, in much the same way you've done today uh, with Tip of the Spear. Um, I do need to say that this project was made possible by support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We are the National, or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Uh, you, you've been watching Sophia Perez, who's also our program officer. And um, on the topic, tip of the spear, how Mariana Islanders see the relationship with the US military. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.